Hi everyone, you're watching the Virtual Amicus and I'm Jay Lodha. Well, today uh, we are joined by someone who needs absolutely no introduction in this very special episode. And uh, the topic for today's session would be on Prevention of Money Laundering Act, wherein we'll be analyzing the law and the recent Supreme Court judgment. And uh, it is a matter of great honor for me to introduce our speaker for today's session who needs absolutely no formal introduction. Today, we are joined by Dr. Aditya Sondi, sir who is a senior advocate and former additional advocate general of the state of Karnataka. So thank you so much, sir, for taking our time for doing this session. And uh, we've kept this in our Q&A format. Anything that you wish to say, sir, because it's an honor to have you over to record this session uh, before we start with our Q&A segment, sir. My pleasure to be here, Jay, and uh, compliments on picking a topic which is, I think, relevant and uh, on which we've not yet heard the last word. Very well, sir. So we'll quickly start with our Q&A segment. Uh, sir, uh, if you could differentiate uh, between uh, what exactly do we mean by money laundering? What offenses constitute to be an offense of money laundering and as well as proceeds of crime? Because this has been repeatedly used in, the, in this landmark Supreme Court judgments. Over to you, sir. See, the concept of money laundering is to be understood in in two ways. One is the broader understanding that the global community used it in. That is uh, the United Nations Declaration, which in fact led to the promulgation of this law. And then there is the very specific understanding of money laundering under the Act by the Supreme Court of India. And there is some divergence there the general understanding of money laundering as the word laundering suggests is really cleaning up uh, what was tainted property or assets, uh, which were assets obtained from criminal activity. That was the general understanding of laundering. How the act sees it is uh, interesting because the definition, as you alluded to, speaks of property obtained or gotten from activity, illegal activity relating to proceeds of crime, which is really proceeds from crimes that are scheduled under the act. Meaning thereby property that is obtained as a result of criminal activity relating to a scheduled offense. And when I say scheduled offense, what is sometimes referred to as a predicate offense also, is really an offense which is listed under the schedule to the PMLA. And that schedule today is a wide spectrum of offenses from the IPC to the NDPS to pollution laws to intellectual property laws to the Information Technology Act, etc. But the interesting aspect is whether the property obtained from proceeds of crime by itself is an offense of money laundering or does it become so when that property is represented or held out as being untainted? And if you look at the provisions of the act, the act uses the word and, if I can read for the benefit of your viewers, because I think this is really the crux that the Supreme Court went into under section three, the offense of money laundering which is whosoever directly or indirectly attempts to indulge, assist, et cetera, involved in any process or activity connected with the proceeds of crime, including its concealment, et cetera, and projecting or claiming it as untainted. Now, if you read that and at first blush, what it suggests is that the offense is only made out when that property or those proceeds of crime are projected or claimed as untainted and not otherwise. And that is really the spirit of money laundering. Proceeds of crime from a scheduled offense is an offense anyway. Let's be clear there. It's not that the PMLA is punishing offenses under the scheduled acts. Each of those scheduled acts have their own punishments. But as you read three, it is when the proceeds of crime from those scheduled offenses are projected or claimed as untainted that the offense of money laundering is made out. But this is really where the complexity also is, where I believe the interpretation by the Supreme Court in Mahesh Chaudhary's case 
has rejected the petitioner's contentions and held that and is to be read as or. Uh, the explanation provided to section three, which sought to read and as or has been held to be valid and not excessive. And as a result today, whether or not the proceeds of crime are projected or claimed as untainted, the offense is made out the moment you are found to conceal, possess, acquire, or use properties that are the proceeds of crime. So to uh, give a, a shorter answer after saying all this, uh, under the PMLA, as it now stands, as in interpreted by the Supreme Court, uh, the very possession uh, or concealment or acquisition of such proceeds of crime itself is money laundering. It's a far, therefore, a far broader offense in Indian law. Um, it, in a way, penalizes you twice over. It penalizes you under the scheduled offense. It penalizes you again under Section 3 of the Act, regardless of whether you project it as being untainted or not. Very well, sir. Now, sir, going ahead with our next question. Sir, uh, since you mentioned about predicate offenses, which are the scheduled offenses, so can we sum it up and say that there's a necessary precondition for an offense to be an offense under PMLA, which is described as a predicate offense. So does this predicate offense has to, uh, uh, has to be an offense under the Indian Penal Code or it could be an offense under any other statute? Oh no, if you look at the schedule, you're right in saying that the existence of the predicate offense is the basis for a prosecution under this act. And that's what the Supreme Court has finally said in Mahesh Chaudhary. It has in fact also gone on to say that if there is an acquittal or a discharge or a quashing of the predicate offense, then the main offense under PMLA does not stand. So in that sense, there is a linkage drawn. Um, the, the act doesn't deal only with offenses. It also deals with attachment and confiscation. And maybe we can talk about that later. But when you look at the schedule to the act itself, you'll be interested to find that there are as many as 29 paragraphs in Schedule A or Part A of the schedule, which are 29 different enactments. And under those enactments, there are multiple offenses that are categorized. So there are therefore, it's not just IPC. IPC itself, I see there are almost uh, maybe 30 offenses that are mentioned, which could trigger a PMLA prosecution. There is the NDPS Act, there is the Explosive Substances Act, there is the UAPA, Arms Act. I, I won't uh, read them all out, but it's a very widespread. And the point to be noted here is that the schedule takes into account not just some of the serious enactments and punishments and penalties that I just mentioned, but it also refers to offenses under the Trademarks Act, the Environment Protection Act, the Copyright Act, uh, so on and so forth. And there, I think, is where, again, our understanding of PMLA seems to be, or money laundering seems to be far broader than the international understanding, in the sense that we have today brought in uh, proceeds of crime, even from offenses that could have been committed under the Trademarks Act. And I think that is something we need to reflect on. Once it is accepted that the predicate offense drives the PMLA as far as the prosecution is concerned, and even the consequential confiscation, then we need to see, we need to test whether this long schedule indeed sits well with the concept of money laundering. We have to see whether proceeds from a trademark act offense give rise to such a pernicious money laundering offense. And I'm saying this because the Supreme Court has repeatedly in Mahesh Chaudhary said that the PMLA is really an act dealing with national security, with uh, the effect of laundered money on the larger Indian economy. And therefore it is treated as a very serious offense. In principle, that position may be correct. But if you look at the types of offenses that are driving PMLA, then I think we need to reflect upon it. Does a Trademarks Act uh, uh, offense or a Copyright Act offense, or for that matter, even an environment legislation offense per se, give rise to uh, a grave and a serious offense of money laundering? 
I think is a question we need to look at. And I'm saying this from experience because many times civil disputes are given the color of a criminal offense. Under the Trademarks Act, uh, you could have a remedy for civil infringement. You could also have a criminal prosecution. And that applies many, many times across the board. Many IPC uh, proceedings, cheating, etc., are often also subject matter of arbitration and civil offenses. And we therefore need to see in light of this schedule, and that, that's where I believe um, we need to relook at the law. We need to look closely at the schedule and not just at the provisions of the main act, because in some way it is the schedule that is driving the, in in the enactment. Very well, sir. Now, sir, going ahead with our next question. Uh, sir, while going through the this landmark uh, judgment by, by the Honorable Supreme Court of India in Vijay Madanlal Chaudhary versus Un Union of India, there has been an emphasis on legislative intent, sir, that the intent behind PMLA is to fight financial frauds, the menace of money laundering. So, so what is your take on legislative intent? Can this be the sole criteria to upheld all the constitutional, uh, the constitutional validity of all the amendments that have taken place in the PMLA? Well, look, legislative intent could be reflected under the statement of objects and reasons. It could be reflected even on the basis of statements made on the floor of the house, it could be on the basis of a white paper, etc. But it's well settled now that those are only ancillary aids to interpreting an enactment. They don't uh, by themselves bind anybody for that matter, and certainly not the court. And that is where intent apart uh, one needs to look closely at the stringent provisions in the Act dealing with the very high standards for grant of bail, the non-provision of the ECIR, the uh, burden of proof having been shifted upon the accused, and the role <coughs> played by the officers under the Act, under Section 50, as to whether they are police officers or civil officers and what the evidentiary value is of statements made before them, are they confessions, etc. Now the intent of the legislature is a point well made. It is meant to deal with a pernicious practice of money laundering. And let me be clear, nobody can argue that money laundering can be condoned or accepted in a democracy, of course not. But that said, do these provisions that I just mentioned unreasonably impinge upon the rights of an accused. And that is the question. And if you look at the judgment in uh, Chaudhary's case, each of these provisions that I mentioned to you have been dealt with in silos or seriatim and upheld on their own. But according to me, it is the interplay between these sections that actually gives rise to some very drastic consequences to an accused. And had the Supreme Court viewed it in that holistic sense, it's possible that a different view could have been taken. In that regard, there are two things to be said. One is that the judgment itself is now under review, as you're aware. Very quickly, uh, the Supreme Court chose to issue notice on the review in a matter of weeks. And therefore, the questions in a way are still open. How far that review will uh, uh, succeed whether matter requires reference to a larger bench, et cetera, I think will be considered. But uh, it's, it's uh, not usual to find a review uh, being entertained this quickly after the judgment. And this is a point I've made in uh, public lectures elsewhere, that the judgment striking down certain sections of the Benami Act, which came almost simultaneously in Ganapati Dealcom. In fact, interestingly, has a paragraph 17.27 where the coordinate bench uh, doubts Vijay Chaudhary's case. So one is these questions are not yet settled. The other thing is that on the matter of bail itself, section 45 of the PMLA has a very high threshold, which is that bail cannot be granted unless the public prosecutor has been given a right to file objections. And secondly, that the special court is convinced that there are reasonable grounds to conclude that the offense has not been made out and that the accused shall not commit any other offense if bail is granted. 
Now that's a very high standard. So this section was already struck down by a two judge bench of the Supreme Court in Nikesh Tarachan. And uh, maybe I'm digressing, but I think this point needs to be made to understand Vijay Choudhury's case that Nikesh Tarachan had already struck down 45. It had struck it down as a whole. And it had found that even though in other cases, the Supreme Court in Kartar Singh and other judgments had upheld such provisions under uh, TADA, etc. The Supreme Court felt the PMLA was not that stringent uh, an enactment to give it parity with a terror enactment. Now, in Vijay Choudhury, the Supreme Court has taken a different view. It has, in fact, reversed Nikesh Tarachand on that point and said that PMLA is very much like a terror le legislation. And secondly, the uh, Article 14 argument that was accepted in Nikesh Tarachand was remedied by Parliament by now bringing in an amendment. I won't go too much into the nitty gritty of that except to say that this bail threshold is very high. Now, if the bail threshold is very high, the burden of proof is on the accused. The officers under Section 50 act both as civil and uh, prosecuting agencies. Um, the act is held to be sui generis. Statements made to them could be used in the criminal proceedings. Then the likelihood of bail itself becomes very, very difficult. And please remember then that somebody who is alleged to have committed a scheduled offense, I'm going back to the point I made, be it under the uh, Trademarks Act or under the Copyright Act or one of the other ancillary enactments could still suffer uh, denial of bail. And I wonder if a person accused of those offenses could be equated to a terror enactment. I think that requires serious consideration. And let me say one more thing before we move to your next question, which is that the Supreme Court in Mahesh Chaudhary has also held that the ECIR need not be given to the accused. And I think this is a very important facet. The ECIR is an enforcement case information report. It is like an FIR. But because the CRPC strictly does not apply to these proceedings in certain cases, that is a separate point. We can also talk about that. It's a special enactment. Because the complaint is not registered like it would be as an FIR under the CRPC in other circumstances, the Supreme Court has said that the ECIR need not be given to the accused. It is sufficient if the accused is simply informed of the reasons for arrest, which are two completely different things. So looking at it just from the bail point of view, and I think this is where maybe the review will go to its logical end that outcomes apart, convictions apart, the moment you are arrested, you are, burden is on you, you have to pass the very high threshold, you have to convince a sessions court or a special court that you are reasonably not guilty of the offense and all this you are doing without even knowing what the charge is against you. You may know the, the broad charge that you have been charged under PMLA, etc. but the details in the ECIR are not with you. And they are with the special court. So the prosecution and the court know the case against you, but the accused does not know the case. And added to that is the trump card that the prosecution agencies have, which is that the uh, statements made by you to the, to the authorities under Section 50 may also be placed before the court by saying, look, here is a confession. And as Mr. Acharya, who was presiding over a session that I spoke at on the PMLA pointed out that sometimes these, these uh, so-called investigations that take place, be them quasi-criminal, criminal, civil, go on for days. And if some statement is given at the end of six, seven, eight days, does that become a confession? It could under the act. And this is what an accused is up against. And I think, I believe strongly that that is where the constitutional argument comes in. And as the Supreme Court had said in Tara Chand's case, if a person doesn't get bail, then his or her ability to conduct their defense itself is vitiated. And you are then therefore moving to a regime where 
accused will remain in jail courts will be hesitant to grant bail because they have to then say that i find sufficient material to conclude that the offence is not committed i mean that's a very high threshold isn't it and i i believe that that is where uh, the problem lies so sir in short it's a it's a herculean task to secure a bail under the pmla now sir and not just bail even sir, anticipatory bail even anticipatory yes. yeah okay now sir going ahead with our next question uh, sir uh, coming back to now enforcement case information report sir um so how different is a regular first information report which is the fir that is lodged in a regular criminal offence different from an enforcement case information report it's different in many ways because look an fir is a purely uh, criminal concept it is a first information report filed under the crpc in terms of the crpc and it's required it is filed with Uh, the 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 authority is concerned making out the basis of an offence and ecir as the supreme court notes and rightly notes is by itself not statutory now if it's not statutory it also partakes both the civil and the criminal dimensions of the case it can it can have information relating to the offence it could also have information that forms the basis of the civil proceedings under the act which is provisional attachment attachment and confiscation i want to make this point that this is an act as the supreme court says is in a sense sui generis because it has both civil and criminal dimensions to it it is not just an offence related enactment so there are ample provisions which deal with attachment confirmation of that attachment by the author adjudicating authority and ultimately confiscation and vesting of those properties in the state so the ecir ecir transcends all of this so in that sense it's more broad spectrum it is wider it has a uh, granular detail some of the ecirs i've seen have granular detail of the transactions relating to these proceeds of crime the background of the transactions where the monies have been uh, invested or used etc so it's different now i wonder why this ecir could not have been made available to it i thought i thought the supreme court could have uh, done that uh, it could have saved any unconstitutional element in the law by reading down a couple of these aspects and saying yes ecir is is non statutory correct but make it available to the accused it's a natural justice element at least the accused then knows the case what's the harm what's the prejudice to the prosecution i mean sooner or later that ecir will be known if it's marked in evidence it will be known and therefore it's better that an accused knows it i think that makes for a fairer process so to cut a long story short an ecir is is different from an fir it's broader it has more granular detail it doesn't confine itself just to the criminal offense but ultimately the supreme court has said it doesn't have to be mandatorily given to the accused and that is that is where the crux of the issue is now sir going ahead with our next question uh so the the act obviously mentions in chapter 5 about summons searches seizures sir if you could explain for the benefit of our viewers in simple language sir the difference between summons searches attachments and seizures sir see to simplify it summons and searches take place as a step in aid to the provisions of the act now the supreme court in mahesh choudhury's case was called upon to also interpret what the meaning of proceedings is under this act and the court held and correctly that proceedings under this act are not merely the investigation qua the criminal offence they could also mean and include the enquiry qua the attachment proceedings and that is where we need to understand that the officers or the officials acting under section 50 carry out the search and seizure functions relating to all such proceedings it's a thin line and an accused may not even know that he or she is an accused while participating in that 
search and seizure. It that search and seizure could lead to a provisional attachment. It could lead to a prosecution or both. And on the attachment, I want to say this: that the attachment is a step in aid to confiscation. The attachment is that. these proceeds of crime should not be dissipated by the delinquent pending proceedings and therefore they are subjected to an attachment an attachment can only take place if there is a charge sheet or a statutory complaint filed qua an offence but then there is an exception to that also which is that in the case of immediate need the officer uh, must record prima facie that there is a risk of the assets being dissipated and therefore make a short term attachment even without the requirement of a charge sheet or a complaint either which way that attachment is subjected to an adjudicatory process and when that adjudicatory process leads to the attachment being confirmed it then leads to a subsequent order of confiscation that confiscation is also relatable to a conviction under the act that brings that closes the circle and brings you back to the predicate offense because if you are acquitted or discharged there there is no offense under the pmla if there is no offense under the pmla naturally then confiscation cannot stand but this is the lay of the act and therefore when you ask me about search and seizure i can't answer it from an ordinary uh, criminal law perspective it transcends information gathering as regards all of these proceedings and therefore the end game could be a conviction and it could be a confiscation both and that confiscation really is what that the proceeds of crime that you have obtained are confiscated and vest in the government so that there is no enrichment on the part of the individual maybe i take a little side step here but i should say this that if confiscation is one of the end objectives apart from conviction what happens to cases where there are bona fide third party claims because as i said everything comes back to the schedule now under the schedule if it is a cheating offence and there is a, a an inter party dispute or a claim by a third party a bona fide claim by a third party on the same assets is the purpose being served by confiscating it to the state and that is also something to reflect on there are provisions i must tell you under the act which deal with the rights of uh, bona fide third party claimants and how those have to be adjudicated but what that's really doing is that if you are not relating the offence to projecting it as untainted then every property every proceed that arises out of this long list of scheduled offences becomes potentially subject to confiscation and i believe there will be quite a quite a mess there will be a great deal of third party litigation because many of these enactments are not just state prosecutions they are a lot of these enactments also deal with offenses uh, qua third party rights and assets procured uh, inter se third parties not everything is terror as i said or ndps some of it could Uh, 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 partake uh, civil claims as well, and that's where now, since the act has been expanded so far, there will be a great deal of litigation, I believe, relating to the third-party claims, uh, qua assets from proceeds of crime. Well, boon for the lawyers and bane for the uh, the accused. Uh, talk about litigation now, sir. Going ahead with our next question. uh this is something that i personally fail to understand sir that in case of a regular murder trial uh, the maximum sentence is obviously a death sentence but there the accused has access to all the possible constitutional safeguards the protections for example the copy of the fir has to be furnished and uh, there is presumption of innocence everybody is uh, you know innocent until proven guilty but in case of an offence under pmla which i presume that the maximum sentence is 10 years how does it make it such a grave offence under the pmla 1 and 2 why would somebody be stripped of all the constitutional guarantees the protections that are otherwise awarded in case of a in case of a murder which is far more serious offence which that attracts death penalty 
that's a that's a good question jay and in some ways that is where the dichotomy lies uh, the supreme court has seen this act as being uh, a more stringent act in some ways more stringent than the offenses in the schedule itself and therefore subject to special provisions of uh, denial of bail etc even under the crpc under section 437 where an offense is of the magnitude that you mentioned the court has the discretion to look into additional circumstances while granting bail which includes the uh, you know the reasonable possibility of the offense having been committed and the material on record so there is a there is a calibration even under the crpc when it comes to more heinous offenses but the point is that many of the scheduled offenses are not even that heinous right so the dichotomy therefore becomes greater so it's really a value judgment that is being made on money laundering and as i said yes money laundering by itself is a serious offense but i would have uh, conditioned that on two criteria which is one that the scheduled offenses must also correlate to the gravity of the offense number 1 and number 2 the definition part that we spoke about earlier that the proceeds ought to be uh, represented or held out as being untainted and that's where the nexus is built otherwise what we've done today is created a a subset or a special set of offenses which overlap with the schedule and as you rightly said the scheduled offenses move in one direction the uh, pmla offense moves in another and though there are provisions under the act for clubbing of offenses for the trial to take place together etc notwithstanding that when it comes to this key issue of bail the criterion could be completely different and somebody who could get bail for the asking for a scheduled offense has a complete himalayan task when it comes to bail under this act and i believe that is probably what uh, uh, struck the conscience of the review bench and caused it to issue notice in uh, ganapati dilkom which is the benami judgment the supreme court in fact said that having perused the judgment i quote having perused the judgment that is mahesh choudhury we are of the opinion that the aforesaid ratio requires further expounding in an appropriate case without which much scope is left for arbitrary application this the supreme court is saying as regards mahesh choudhury and that arbitrary application is really what would be or could be the outcome uh, of the the scenario that you uh, referred to well thank you so much sir for taking our time for doing this session for us uh, you know for all the valuable insights we could not have thought of a better speaker than you sir and this really means a lot sir uh, as parting words anything that you wish to say before we finally wrap this up no thank you thank you for inviting me jay i enjoyed this interaction very well thank you so much sir thank to you. all the viewers who are watching our email is mentioned on the channel feel free to write to us your queries on any of the fundamentals that we discussed in this landmark uh, pmla ruling and stay tuned next episode is on its way it's goodbye for now thank you sir once again thank you